good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to join uh, you in the Mebo Miami Meetup. I'm Elizabeth Shepherd, and today I will introduce how the gut microbiome and diet are relevant to those who have the condition known as trimethylaminuria or primary trimethylaminuria, a disorder which is caused by mutations um, in the FMO3 gene. The term microbiome refers to a collection of bacteria that inhabit a particular niche in our body. And we have a number of these microbiomes. For example, we will have a skin microbiome, the bacteria that are found in our skin, our nose, in our eyes, and in many different niches, including the gastrointestinal tract. If we take all these bacterial cells together, we actually have 10 times more bacterial cells in, our, in and on our body than the number of human cells that make up our body. So there are 10 to the 13 cells in a human, so we have 10 to the 14 bacterial cells or 100 trillion cells compared to 10 trillion cells of the human body. Now, 90% of an adult human then you could consider is bacterial cells. Now how do we acquire um, a microbiome. Well, a baby is born without microbiome, but um, it will inherit its mother's microbiome, particularly if it's born from a vaginal uh, delivery. A baby born by a cesarean section will develop its microbiome slightly uh, delayed from that of a, a vaginal birth. Now, the microbiome is absolutely essential. It provides functions that people say feed us, form us, and protect us. And what is meant by that is the bacteria, particularly for example in our gut, will digest complex molecules providing us with nutrients. They form us, the bacteria help us to develop um, an immune system, and they protect us because if we are inhabited by non-pathogenic bacteria, they will protect us from being inhabited by pathogenic bacteria that can cause disease. Now the microbiome that I want to uh, discuss very briefly today is the gut microbiome, the bacteria that inhabit all of the regions of the gastrointestinal tract. Now this is a huge area inside our bodies and we have bacteria that inhabit the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, the cecum, and the colon. So why is the gut microbiome relevant to primary trimethylaminuria? Well, when we eat food, there are a number of dietary components that have the general structure that is shown on this slide where we have N, which is nitrogen, and the group CH3, which we call a methyl group. And this little group is a trimethylamine group. Um, the R just stands for um, a number of other uh, atoms that might be linked to this molecule. And microbial action in the gut will break the bond between what I've shown as R and the nitrogen and will liberate this molecule trimethylamine. So this reaction is actually carried out in the gut by bacteria that reside in our gut. This trimethylamine molecule is very quickly absorbed and is taken to the liver and in the liver we have this enzyme called FMO3 which is able to catalyze a reaction which adds an oxygen, the O here, onto the nitrogen to form the molecule called trimethylamine oxide, which is then ra very rapidly excreted through the kidneys. Now the difference between these two molecules is that trimethylamine has a very pungent smell and trimethylamine and oxide does not. And so the cause of trimethylamine urea is when the FMO3 gene carries a mutation such that the enzyme that is encoded by this gene cannot carry out this reaction very efficiently. 
Now, the name FMO3, or flavin containing monooxygenase 3, is quite a long name, but it just simply means that uh, this enzyme has to have the help of a small little chemical group called a flavin, and it's a monooxygenase. And that simply means that one atom of oxygen is added to the substrate. The substrate for the enzyme in this case is trimethylamine, and the oxygen is added to produce the molecule trimethylamine N-oxide. Now there are multiple microbiome-mediated pathways that can lead to trimethylamine production. We know that this trimethylamine is produced only by the action of bacteria, because if we look at animals that have never been exposed to a microbiome, and you can do this by rearing the animals in a sterile environment, never touched by human hand, then these animals do not produce trimethylamine. But we are inhabited by a microbiome that has the capacity to produce trimethylamine. Now in the gut, we have many different pathways that can be carried out by different bacteria to produce trimethylamine. So the trimethylamine here is shown as TMA in red. Bacteria can actually convert trimethylamine to trimethylamine oxide and use it themselves. So this would be by a bacterial enzyme. Actually, trimethylamine and oxide is a very important molecule for some bacteria and helps them to survive in our gut. But the trimethylamine is also produced, and not all of it is converted for the use of the bacteria, and the rest, of course, is absorbed and then moves to our liver. Now, I talked about the diet, and there are a number of different uh, constituents of the diet that have been shown uh, when you culture bacteria to be able to give rise to trimethylamine. And these include choline, uh, betaine, carnitine, and also trimethylamine and oxide itself. And I'll come back to that in a minute. The problem that we have is, first of all, we have a lot of bacteria. We have multiple pathways that can produce trimethylamine and many different bacteria phyla, that is collections of related bacteria, can produce trimethylamine. So there isn't one particular bacterial species that we can pinpoint to say this is the one that produces trimethylamine. A lot of bacteria can carry out this reaction. So I said I would come back to trimethylamine and oxide as a dietary source for the production of trimethylamine. Now marine fish are the richest dietary source of trimethylamine. And the reason for this is that fish that live in the sea live in an environment that has a very high uh, salt concentration. And as fish move from different concentrations of salt, they need to protect their proteins. And this is a survival mechanism for uh, the fish. So what they do is they actually increase the amount of a fish flavin containing monooxygenase protein and they produce a lot of trimethylamine and oxide and this molecule is able to protect their proteins from basically breaking down it protects the muscles of the fish and so certain uh, marine fish produce about 3 milligrams of trimethylamine and oxide per gram now, it's not just uh, fish that live in the sea that use this mechanism. Fish that live, for example, in deep lakes or deep in the sea as well, they are subject to quite strong pressure changes um, in water pressure changes. And they also use this mechanism, the production of trimethylamine and oxide, to protect their proteins when they are subjected to these pressure changes. Now, in the human gut, when we eat uh, marine fish or fish that have uh, from deep lakes, the trimethylamine and oxide is converted to trimethylamine by a bacterial enzyme 
called a trimethylamine and oxide reductase. That simply means this enzyme removes the oxygen. And then I mentioned on the previous slide that bacteria also have this enzyme that can uh, make trimethylamine and oxide, uh, and in this case they we call the enzyme trimethylamine monooxygenase. I'm showing the two reactions, but the reaction that's happening in our gut is very much in favor of the trimethylamine and oxide uh, being converted to trimethylamine. And because there's so much of it, uh, we will then have a lot of trimethylamine absorbed because we've eaten a diet that would be rich in marine fish. So dietary management is recommended uh, for uh, trying to uh, control the symptoms of primary trimethylaminuria. So how do we actually measure the content uh, of a particular foodstuff? Well, when you see these tables that tell you what trimethylamine content is in a food, this is, will generally have been done by um, a, a scientist taking uh, the foodstuff and chemically digesting it under quite hard, harsh conditions to liberate um, as much of the trimethylamine as is possible by those conditions. So this will give you um, one particular value. And then other studies have done what we call biological digestion studies on particular foods, that is monitoring uh, a specific food taken in by an individual and then monitoring the excretion of trimethylamine and trimethylamine and oxide in the urine. Now the two methods don't always give the same answer. One is a very harsh chemical condition and the other one is reliant on the biological digestion of the foodstuff in the gut by the bacteria that reside in the gut of that individual. So on this slide, I've included a table of different foodstuffs uh, indicating the amount of trimethylamine generated from a certain amount uh, of the foodstuff by chemical digestion and the amount of trimethylamine released by biological action by feeding to a volunteer the same amount of that food. This was a study that was carried out by Mitchell, Zhang and Smith and if anyone would like to uh, consider this publication in more detail, I've included the digital object identifier at the bottom of the slide. So on this slide, we're looking primarily at uh, fruit and vegetables. And you can see, as I said, the answers are not always the same uh, from the chemical and the biological digestion. So just looking at a table doesn't necessarily give you the amount of trimethylamine that might be released um, when a human eats this particular foodstuff. Now all of these numbers are quite low uh, for these particular foodstuffs. Here I've included some of the values from the study, the same study by Mitchell, Zhang and Smith, where they've now looked at foodstuffs such as chicken, mushrooms, pork, egg, beef, soya, lamb, mackerel and cod. And I think what you can see that is very striking is for example chicken, which chemically would give a certain value for trimethylamine, biologically gives a lower value. Mushrooms actually from their study shows a greater value of trimethylamine both chemically and biologically than it, uh, is found in chicken. But as we go down uh, the table, what is very striking is that when we get to the sea fish, the seafood, mackerel and cod, there's an extraordinary amount of trimethylamine produced by these particular um, fish. And this is for the reasons that I explained about the, the seafood um, fish having to produce trimethylamine as a survival mechanism because of the salinity of the sea in which they reside. Now, I don't have a value here for a river fish, but river fish are not subjected to the high salt concentrations, and therefore they do not produce 
high amounts of trimethylamine and oxide. So definitely what one can say from looking at this table is that um, definitely to be avoided is any form of seafood um, if one suffers from a trimethylamine urea. Now I've included this slide uh, not because it has anything to do with the gut microbiome but just as a cautionary tale um, from a study that was done on volunteers that were fed 300 grams of Brussels sprouts a day for several weeks and this study showed a reduced amount of trimethylamine in oxide urinary excretion in other words the eating of these large amounts of Brussels sprouts increased the amount of trimethylamine excreted in the urine. And then the researchers went on to identify, by quite a complex uh, procedure, chemicals within the Brussels sprouts, and then they used these chemicals to identify the ones and to see if they actually were directly inhibiting the activity of the enzyme. And they were able to do this. We call this chemical an indole. And these dietary indoles found in Brussels sprouts actually inhibit uh, the enzyme. So this is also something uh, to be avoided in that one wouldn't want to eat a foodstuff that is actually going to inhibit the enzyme activity if a person is already compromised by either the amount or the activity of the enzyme that they uh, possess. So to summarize, the diet includes precursors for trimethylamine, which is liberated by gut bacterial action. The gut microbiome is person-specific. So the liberation of trimethylamine from a particular foodstuff may differ from person to person. And the gut microbiome itself is not static. It will, depend, it will change depending on our diet. And this is because what we eat feed the bacteria that inhabit our gut. So a diet that reduces trimethylamine in one person may not be as reliable in another person because of the interplay between what they have eaten and the bacterial species that reside in their gastrointestinal tract. So here I've uh, included a link to the Human Microbiome Project. This is a huge uh, project that is revealing extraordinary things about our reliance um, and our interactions with the bacteria that inhabit our body. And the second link is to uh, actually to an exhibition which is called Invisible You. And that means the bacteria that in inhabit us but which we can't see. And it, this can be accessed at the URL that I've shown, which is part of the Eden Project in the United Kingdom. But their website has a lot of information um, about the microbiome. And this project is, has been sponsored by the Wellcome Trust.